Uh, good afternoon. Um, so in this paper, I'm going to examine TV previews from the girls magazine Just 17, particularly those printed between 1985 and 1987, which is what I'm working on at the moment. And they're drawn from um, the archive holdings we have in our special collections in the Femorabilia collection at uh, LJMU. I'm going to outline some of the issues that these raise by TV reviews and previews, and in particular around the importance that I wish to argue for of archival research on this type of material relating to the relationship between television and young viewers. Where archives of these magazines have been built and maintained, as they have at LJMU, thanks to the work of um, people like academic and librarian colleagues such as Val Stevenson um, and the late Nikki Ann Moody. And this ties in for me with some of the themes raised earlier about the um, invisibility often of women's labour in archival work. They provide opportunities to re-examine their representations of cultural and media forms for a teenage readership. They also allow researchers to engage with aspects of their content that have been underexplored by those existing studies. Um, little attention has been paid among the vast range of work done on women's and girls' magazines to their representations of screen media and their framing of how audiences might engage from among that readership with popular film and television. So I'm going to offer some insights so far from work in progress um, and perhaps a bit of an assessment of future possibilities for these magazines as a research, uh, resource for TV and archival research. Some background then to the Femorabilia archive. Um, Popular Girls magazines, the likes of Jackie, Just 17, My Guy, and others were significant sources of advice and instruction for their readers during the last decades of the 20th century. However, in spite of their popularity and commercial success, girls' comics and magazines have historically been undervalued both financially and culturally in comparison to comics for boys, as research like Mel Gibson's has noted. They've been regarded as ephemeral, many Archived copies um, we've heard about have just been thrown away, we've been told by former readers. Though, so their preservation and archiving has been precarious. Our own Femorabilia collection holds over 130 different titles and more than 3,500 items, including extensive runs of many popular 20th century girls and women's magazines. This collection allows for close study of these texts and research on significant archives of popular media material. Nikki Ann Moody has discussed the Femorabilia collection as a resource that addresses and serves multiple audiences, including students, present and future researchers and local communities. In preserving copies of girls' and women's popular periodicals of the 20th century, it aims to recover a popular media culture which Moody viewed as very much in danger of being lost and spoken for only by the academics of the 20th and 21st centuries who have had access to those texts as they were published, if not to the culture itself. Um, the contemporary critical view of popular magazines is strongly uh, shaped by existing and historical research studies, such as Angela McRobbie's seminal work on Jackie. The resources then of the Femorabilia collection enables continued analysis of these historical media texts with the opportunity to re-examine fresh um, previous assumptions and develop fresh insights on the basis of archival examination. The research currently ongoing then makes use of editions from Just 17 from 1985 to 1987 donated by a former reader and now held in the Femorabilia collection. 
So a brief background, very brief, Just, Seem, Just 17 was launched in autumn 1983 and it was published by EMAP until 2004. It was a sibling publication of the pop music magazine Smash Hits, overlapping in its coverage of pop music and other popular media forms, but aiming at the then healthy market for girls and women's magazines. And the research aims to address some of the aspirations of Moody's research in preventing this popular media form from being understood as a homogenous mass, as well as challenging theoretical perspectives and models about popular cultural products. Um, my research argues that Just 17 is a media product itself highly attuned to the wider media landscape in which it exists, including the film, television, music and entertainment industries. And I would argue that it offers particular insights into the historical development of television viewing as a leisure activity for girls and young women during the 1980s. So... I'm interested in what Just 17 might be able to tell us about television viewing as a domestic practice and the role of teenage girls as household members and participants in that viewing practice during this period of time. And this project's in its early stages, but I hope to be able to take that then forward. Um, what's been particularly helpful to me in that work is to think about archives not only in terms of the archives of the magazines themselves that we hold but in terms of criticism in the field which for a media history based project can become contemporaneous again. So when I was formulating research questions I decided that one of the areas I wanted to explore was the context for viewing in terms of whether girls were viewing alone or in company and if it was the latter what company. So I found that just as re-examining the archive magazines yielded insights, so did a return to some established works of television viewing research from cultural studies during this period of interest, the 1980s. So David Morley's work in family television and its primary research with families, for instance, was illuminating. It was able to correct my initial assumptions that viewing would be mostly synchronous because of the families he interviewed, 18 families in spring 1985, all of them owned a video. So how much would asynchronous viewing be a feature for teenage girls' habits? This was corroborated and complemented by Anne Gray's uh, video Playtime, um, published in 1992, but based on Gray's doctoral research and data gathered in the late 1980s. Um, from interviews with women, their partners and children. And Gray's research supports the sharply gendered findings of Morley and the difference between, for instance, genre and TV series preferences. But notes in particular that teenage girls were adept at video record use, whereas on the other hand, their mothers tended to abstain from any involvement. So this sets up um, a background to the idea of viewing as a social practice and a domestic practice um, that I wanted to explore. And we can see then that this is also a period in which um, I expected viewing to be a shared resource and a shared space and to go on in that context. And I wanted to be able to draw on those studies of family viewing while focusing on the teenage perspective as centred in the magazines. Um, this was the period, happily then, where TV reviews and previews became a regular feature in Just 17. It was launched as a fortly mag fortnightly magazine in its beginnings in the autumn of 1983, but its success meant that in January 1985, it became a weekly publication. It was announced it would become then. It was in the first weekly edition, which was out in February 1985, that the first TV previews appeared, and this then became a regular feature in the magazine. So in terms of the um, noted habits, challenges, experiences that come out of this idea of how viewing took place and whether it was shared, a couple of initial themes that have emerged 
that I'll sketch out in the, the time we've got available today. First of all, the variety covered in these um, early previews. Initially, the feature was titled This Week and had sections covering TV and radio alongside ones covering either music or film. Um, the very first feature, which is included on the screen here, sorry about the, the quality, um, is the first feature included all three of those and there was a plus section at the end with some miscellaneous delights. So we're told about European League table tennis in Portsmouth, the Magicians Convention in Blackpool and the International Canoe Exhibition at Crystal Palace. And this reflects the cautiousness with which Just 17 was establishing its media coverage, not wanting to be too narrow. And that promises for some interest in future research that can be done on gender and genre in addition to this. I'm interested in the idea of agency and individual viewing taking place within the family home. So shared viewing is a point of interest but so too is individual viewing which Morley's work and Gray's work show is happening often by time shifting viewing as Gray's respondents talk about. One of her interviewees discusses her daughter, her 18 year old daughter watching her programmes late at night. Um, to everyone's annoyance she manages to watch what she's recorded and I'm quite interested in that um, annoyance. Um, but the idea that a variety of interests also leads to separate viewing, as per Sandra, who says, I like to watch how Reed's own pet and the young ones. My mum and dad can't stand them. They don't see how it can be funny. Now, it's notable in Just 17, particularly in Christmas editions of the magazine, not only is the TV preview section expanded, but the framing of programmes more strikingly indicates their status as shared viewing. So we're told that the snowman, for instance, will keep your kid's sister happy. Um, they remark of Airwolf that your brother will probably like it too. So we have very much a sense of compromise family viewing being established as the context here. Just 17 incorporates more and more coverage of video reviews, as in videos to rent as well. So I'll be interested to see how that is represented as it continues. And then briefly and finally, the idea of embarrassment. And here, um, Daisy Paling's work is really helpful. This is on uh, vaginal deodorant advertising of the 1970s. Um, and Paling talks about the idea of the potential for embarrassment and women actually writing to ask for the ads to be discontinued because they didn't want to watch them in front of others, particularly um, brothers, boyfriends and, and so on. And there is therefore plenty of potential for girls' magazines with their unmatched ability to discuss potentially embarrassing topics in what was the closest thing to privacy that a media text could offer, how they might touch on the idea of TV viewing that you didn't want to share as well as TV viewing that you did or were pressured in various ways to share. So to conclude then I want to argue that these magazines have an ability to act as a different kind of screen archive. They do not of course directly vouch for what their teenage viewers actually watched. However just 17 traded, like other such magazines, on its accuracy in tapping into the current and aspirational thinking of its audience. It's likely that TV previews that didn't hit the mark will change over time, as would the discourses used to frame viewing as both a social and an individual act. Therefore, examining the development of the TV preview features over time is something that will be enabled by our substantial collection of Just 17 during this period, in which I hope to take on board Moody's caution about being reliant on spectacular examples rather than quotidian ones, something echoed in early discussions about women-centred media. Uh, so I'm optimistic about what the archives can show and in gathering suggestion ideas about using the collections to further sustain the interest of contemporary girls in the historical management of their media viewing and their media use. Thank you. Interestingly, there, there isn't so much a sense of that transition, even though there is that expectation of shared viewing. In what I've seen 
so far, and it's quite early days. There is more of an emphasis, I would say, on adult viewing. And when you think about the genres that are covered particularly, um, I would say soaps, but in particular EastEnders, which of course is very new and has started in February 1985. EastEnders fre features regularly. There is an assumption that the readers will be keeping up with that. And of course, at the time, EastEnders was also regarded as, you know, hard-hitting soap, adult issues, and so on. So it's quite interesting to see that kind of focus. There's, a, there's also quite a lot of inclusion of um, serious media, lots of, you know, award-winning films and so on get covered, lots of music coverage. So I would say on the basis of what I've been exploring so far, it leans towards pulling its girl readers into an adult world of viewing. Strangely, while recognising that they don't get complete control over what they're viewing and they have to make these compromises like record your programmes and watch them late at night when there's no one else around. But in terms of content, I would say it's leaning in that direction. More implicit, so it wasn't... It was the in the background, structurally, the links were there in practice not alluded to because technically it was competition although of course it wouldn't necessarily function in that way and of course some of the content is clearly in competition because there is so much I mean if you look at in the in the 1970s this is intense pop coverage that you see in Jackie and then in Just 17 Just 17 is very interesting for this purpose because it, it's the age when TV starts to become an important part of the content in the magazine. And pop is still there, and lots of music-based TV. And in fact, radio, there's quite a bit of radio in these early years that is also covered um, and reviewed. So there's a, a, a fairly clear expectation that these readers will also be listening to Radio 1 you know, on a daily, frequent basis, for example. Um, but not mention... There's, there isn't any mention of other publications. No, that, stay, that stays well out of the way. Thank you. But tonally, I think we can see some similarities. Absolutely. That's uh, to, to sound like a you know person resigned to my own comfortable cardigan wearing middle age. Um, <laughs> that's something in terms of future research. I'm going to get the girls to tell me. Um, and I think I, I am not the best person to make that discovery. But what I'm hoping in some planned research is to do work with teenage girls of now um, and some research distance to say. And I, I hope that what it can engender is some cross-generational research. And I think, because I'd, I'd like to, and I'm planning at the moment, just on a pilot project to do some interviews with um, magazine readers because... There has been some of that done, but I think very little, and I worry to sound slightly morbid that it will get to a point where it will be too late to do that. Um, but I think it would be nice to create a kind of oh, sorry, cross-generational dialogue where girls can look at these magazines and we say, where would you return to now? I mean, in terms of research we've done with teenagers, what they find impossible to comprehend is the amount of time that it would take to correspond with the magazine. So you'd write a letter to the problem page, put it in a post box, and then wait, and then it would be sent from Dundee, where DC Thompson worked, or somewhere else, and, the, and you'd wait weeks for that. And that, there's a, unbearable. How could anyone cope with that? So it's a, it, it's a very different media world, and I'm, I'm looking to, to them to define it for me, I think, is my, my cop-out answer with that. <laughs>